Good evening, everyone. Thank you very, very much for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Jackie Tolkien, and I'm with Tokyo Jolt. And tonight, we're very, very happy to have uh, Judith Kormosh and uh, Shungo Suzuki with us to talk about fluency. Uh, and uh, <laughs> Judith is joining us from the other side of the world. <laughs> Shungo is here in Japan, uh, but we're very, very happy to have both of you with us tonight. So thank you very much. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, everyone, for um, for joining us um, on Friday afternoon and giving up your, your Friday fun um, activities um, for listening to fluency um, presentations and, and our research on, on fluency. So, But I hope it will be also Friday fun for you. Um, and it's a real pleasure um, to present on um, uh, our series of research projects that we have conducted together with um, Dr. Shungo Suzuki, um, who um, most of this research was part of Shungo's um, PhD, um, I think almost all of it, uh, with some follow-up uh, analysis and, and, and studies afterwards. And, and, and most of the credit uh, concerning the research actually goes to, to Shungo. Um, and I feel honored to, to have been able to, to still um, uh, give part of, of this talk um, as his supervisor. And, and, and we have had many discussions about the designs of these studies and the analysis and so on. So um, fluency is an important uh, construct in uh, second language acquisition research, uh, in language teaching, we aim uh, to um, uh, develop our students' fluency to be able to speak efficiently without hesitations, uh, to participate in interactions uh, smoothly. And fluency is also an important construct that is being assessed in language exams. So it is really important to find out what predicts second language fluency and how uh, task performance can uh, vary uh, in terms of fluency depending on the characteristics of the task because it has implications for language pedagogy and, and language assessment. Now, um, you must have heard the term uh, fluency for sure, and you might have uh, intuitive knowledge about what fluency is. Um, and as I said, fluency is a really important uh, construct in a number of language uh, tests. Um, you can see some of them here, the IELTS, the TOEFL, I IBT, and all the testing organizations have developed different uh, rubrics uh, for scoring uh, second language fluency. And we'll see at some point later in this presentation how these rubrics uh, correspond to theoretical concepts or perhaps how they don't. Um, but before we go into that, let us review uh, conceptualizations of second language fluency uh, from a theoretical perspective. Um, we here we will draw on a study conducted by uh, Parvane uh, Tavakoli and Anne-Marie Hunter um, relatively recently in 2018. And um, Parvane Tavakoli and Anna Mary Hunter examined how UK-based second language teachers understand the construct of fluency, and they used open-ended uh, questioner items uh, for, for this. Their results uh, showed that fluency uh, was most commonly conceptualized as a synonym to overall speaking ability. So you can see 43.8% of students, um, of, of respondents, of teachers uh, thought that uh, fluency corresponds to overall speaking ability. Only a smaller percent uh, equated it with, uh, with temporal uh, fluency. Um, and this is the kind of more narrow uh, conceptualization of fluency. And this is how uh, fluency is generally uh, defined in the field of second language acquisition. Now, building on their in-depth analysis of the questionnaire data, they proposed four different perspectives uh, to fluency from very broad at the bottom to the very narrow at the top. Um, and so you will now see how these definitions can vary in, those, in the widths of scope 
from from broad to narrow and what we mean by that and how this is actually um, uh, translated uh, or or um, or represented in uh, in high stakes tests. So if you we look at, for example, uh, some of the rating criteria um, in the IELTS um, and TOEFL exams. Here you can see that some of the words highlighted coherently, cohesive features, and so on. So you have the fluency features, the temporal elements and hesitations, but also you, you co coherence and cohesion is included in, in these descriptors. If you look at the TOEFL exam, then uh, pronunciation, intonation, intelligibility are, um, are included as a fluency criteria. So you can see that they extend the very narrow concept conceptualizations of, of fluency um, to uh, somewhat broader conceptualizations, right? Uh, so this is what um, uh, is represented here. Um, fluency is also viewed from um, slightly different perspectives. Um, and um, Norman Sagalovitz, um, who you can see um, at the, uh, in the corner of the slide holding his really famous uh, green uh, uh, book, um, he proposed three um, sub-constructs of oral fluency. Um, the utterance of fluency a construct, the cognitive fluency construct, and the perceived fluency uh, construct. So utterance fluency in the middle uh, refers to te temporal characteristics of uh, actual speech, such as pose frequency and speed of delivery. Uh, cognitive fluency is what underlies uh, speaking for performance in terms of linguistic knowledge and linguistic skills, such as sentence uh, construction, abilities and skills, lexical retrievers, etc. Lexical retrieval, etc. And finally, perceived fluency is concerned with uh, with listeners' subjective judgments of uh, of uh, fluency and and how competent the speaker is um, in um, producing speech. So you can see that that these sub constructs move from the speaker to speech to listeners. Um, and um, and this is all embodied in different uh, research directions on, on fluency. Um, in understanding the relationship between fluency and speech production processes, which will be important for our study in particular, let us look at how um, speech fluency phenomena can reflect different phases and, and, and stages of uh, second language speech production. When we plan what we want to say, in other words, we conceptualize um, our message, um, then we think of the ideas and we might put some of these ideas into some kind of linguistic shape, depending on the language that we are, we are speaking. It, in doing this, we tend to pose at close boundaries, right? So this is where I pose now and think about what I'm going to say next. Um, the next stage is formulation, which is when we give linguistic shape. We linguistically encode the information we want to convey using syntactic building procedures, lexical retrieval me mechanisms. Now, if there is a problem at this stage, for example, I, a, a word would not just not occur to me, um, then I would uh, pose in the middle of the close and uh, look for the word or restart or reformulate. Once we have done this, then we need to articulate what we have said. This is um, um, embodied in the articulatory speed um, measure. Um, and then finally, we also check the accuracy and appropriacy of our speech through monitoring. And if we notice that we have made a mistake or we would like to say something differently, then we'd repair ourselves. And this would be the, the self-repair. Um, and that in this would be reflected in, in self-repairs. Um, and you can see the, some of the composite measures of speech fluency. The measure of articulation rate is a general speed measure that shows uh, how efficiently you all do all this within real time and the pressures of communication. And then um, the mean length of run uh, and speech rate, they also include uh, some of the, the posing phenomena. So they are not just speed measures of fluency, but they reflect the overall efficiency of all of these processes. Right. Now, um, there has been an, a, 
an extensive research on uh, what the relationship is between utterance fluency and perceived fluency. Um, and typically the question that uh, researchers have uh, asked is what kinds of utterance features predict listeners' judgments of fluency? Why is this important? Because this is what we should develop in our students to seem fluent, but also this is what we should assess uh, when we um, um, want to give a score to how fluent the student is, or this is what we need to understand to develop automated assessments of fluency. Um, However, little is known about the, the link between cognitive fluency and utterance fluency. So we don't really know much, or we didn't know much before Shungo's uh, PhD. Um, what is the linguistic knowledge and linguistic skills that underlie uh, uh, utterance fluency and support um, students to speak fluently? Um, and, and in this talk, this is um, what we'll discuss first, and Shungo will present that. And then, um, the second study that we'll present uh, is uh, a study on task different uh, task related uh, differences in fluency. Sorry, the, there's this typo I have just uh, noticed here. Um, and there has been um, a lot of research actually in this area. Many studies have looked at how test characteristics influence. Uh, complexity, accuracy, fluency, so the traditional cough measures, um, some of you probably have heard about them a lot, uh, but a lot of these studies didn't use fine-grained measures, they mostly used speech rate, and um, they manipulated cognitive complexity slightly differently from what we have done in our study. And our study also included like an integrated task and a multimodal task. Most, most of the task types that were investigated previously were quite limited um, in, in nature. Um, so just um, before Shungo takes over, let me give you one more uh, conceptualization of, uh, of fluency. Um, and here we um, look at um, a bit more detail into uh, utterance fluency. And uh, traditionally, as you can see in the slide, uh, researchers have followed this three-dimensional model of utterance fluency, um, namely speed fluency, which I have already shown you in the previous slide that reflects the overall efficiency of encoding breakdown fluency uh, is to do with posing. Um, what do we do and how frequently do, uh, do breakdowns occur in our speech and then repair fluency, which is includes self-repetitions and, and, and repairs. And, um, and originally, um, this kind of tripartite uh, conceptualization was proposed by Tavakoli and Skien. Uh, and, and they propose it based on four uh, uh, prompts with narrative tasks. And, um, and Shungo's um, study um, tested this in a wider variety of, of, of task types. And, and we found that this um, uh, theoretical conceptualization is actually confirmed uh, by the data that we also had. So this was the, um, um, the, the result of that study. Um, and then um, one more study to give you a, a, a background um, and, and theoretical foundation. Um, as our uh, study conducted with, uh, again, Shungo being the first author and Uchihara uh, helping us in the, in the meta-analysis. And um, in this study, um, we investigated the associations between subjective fluency ratings and temporal uh, features. And this was a meta-analysis based on uh, um, a large number of studies and, and, and FX sizes. Um, we have to note that only monologic speech was included, and we had six uh, selected um, measures. Um, and these measures tapped into uh, different uh, features of, um, of, of fluency. And, uh, uh, and I think from this point, Shungo will uh, go, go on and explain what we have found. So I actually go back, because not to reveal all the findings yet, right? Is that right, Shungo? Yes, yes. Yes, yes. so I stopped sharing. Yeah. Okay, yeah, then I'm going and to share the we, screen. Yeah, we'll take over. So. Yes, thanks very much. Okay. Okay, thanks very much, Judith. It was very beautiful summary and about the, you know, what fluency researchers have done so far. Then I think it's already quite good food for thought for the Japanese people particularly enjoying that Friday evening at this moment. Okay, so now I give you, um, uh, I'm starting my part by the uh, preliminary 
introduction of the, uh, you know, the meta-analysis about which fluency measures are really important to predict the uh, subjective ratings of fluency from the human's listener's perspective. Okay, actually, as I it in already introduced, we used the sort of a meta-analysis just because, you know, the research on the relationship between perceived fluency and temporal features of fluency has been relatively extensively examined in the field of fluency. That's why we decided to um, doing the meta-analysis, which would be sort of very, uh, which would give a important insights into the domain of fluency. And also because it was also enduring the pandemic, and then it was really, really difficult to conduct experimental study, experimental research uh, design. So that's sort of practical reason for it. But anyway, then I'll show you the results of the meta-analysis then. Oh, let's go on. Just one moment, please. Okay, yeah. So this is a visualization of what we found. And first, you know, composite measures show the strongest effect sizes like speech rate and mean length run. Obviously, because the composite measures can tap into multiple aspects of fluency. Yeah. And second, the speed fluency and pause frequency were also strongly related to subjective ratings of fluency, while the duration aspects of breakdown fluency were only moderately associated with the fluency judgment. So depending on the you know, aspects of breakdown fluency, the association between the Saved fluency and latent fluency can, you know, vary. Yeah. Finally, you know, actually, fluency research have very mixed findings about, you know, how you know APR fluency is really, you know, related to the perceived fluency. But our meta-analysis showed that, you know, APR fluency was weakly but significantly associated with the fluency ratings. So taken together, all of three dimensions of fluency might contribute to human-based fluency judgments in a meaningful manner, but to a, you know different degree, depending on the you know, dimension of the fluency or aspects of fluency that you know, the given measure tap into. So this is our findings. And then, most of it, you know, as you did explain using the speech production model, uh, we have sort of very interested, we are interested in this theoretical assumption that formulation processes in the speech productions are mostly related to the pausing behavior in the middle of clauses, which can be measured by the mid clause pause duration and mid cross pause frequency. So we conducted some ad hoc analysis to the, the meta-analysis. Then notably, we found that mid cross pause measures, that is a frequency and duration of pauses in the middle of clauses, were associated with fluency ratings as strongly as composite measures. This is surprising, yeah? So you cannot ignore where students stop while they are speaking in the foreign language or second language in the, in the context of assessment of fluency. Yeah, so this is our message. And then, so we have found subjective ratings of fluency are associated with the speed of fluency, breakdown fluency, and repair fluency to a varying extent. Then let's see what kinds of underlying linguistic knowledge are relevant to achieve fluent speech production by second language learners. So in contrast to the research on the relationship between the speech subjective judgment of fluency and the objective you know, temporal characteristics, characteristics of fluency, uh, the, the link between the cognitive fluency, which, which means the underlying linguistic competence, and also the utterance fluency is surprisingly under-researched in the domain of fluency research. And then, actually, there are only a few studies on this topic, including you know, ours, which I'm going to introduce today, and also the work done by Nibia de Jong and Jimin Khan. So we only have you know, several studies about this in relationship between cognitive fluency and uh, utterance fluency so far. So to extend the research on the cognitive and utterance fluency link, we examined what linguistic knowledge can contribute to three dimensions of utterance fluency at the level of constructs, or statistically speaking, at the level of latent variables. So that's the reason why we use the confirmatory factor analysis and the structural equation modeling for statistical analysis to control for the measurements errors, uh, which entails in, in which you know that most of the you know, observed variables entails. The data set were collected from the 128 Japanese learners of English at some university in Japan, and most of them were classified as B1 to B2 levels on the CFR scale according to their university placement test scores. And we used four different speaking tasks, just, just because we're interested in the, you know, the task effects on the relationship between linguistic knowledge and the speaking performance. Um, yeah. Then the details and the theoretical justification of choosing these choosing these four tasks will be explained by Judith as part of the second study. But at this moment, let me just briefly introduce what they look like. 
The first one is argumentative speech, where students were given some debatable statement, and then they were asked to discuss how far they would agree or disagree with the statement. So basically, the content of speech is largely open to, you know, open-ended, and it's completely up to your students. Yeah, they have to think about content of speech by themselves. The second one is the most typical one in the second language research, the picture narrative tasks, where students are asked to describe a cartoon-based prompt, visual prompt. So there's no linguistic information were provided to the students before speaking. And then the remaining two speaking tasks are basically uh, integrated tasks. Yeah. In the leading two speaking tasks, students read some passage, and then they were asked to retell the content of the passage in their own words. But meanwhile, in the leading while listening to speaking tasks, basically the procedure is the same as the previous one. Uh, I mean, the reading to speaking tasks, but the students can listen to the audio recording of the passage while they are reading it, so, which means they receive the multi-modal input for uh, processing the, in the passage of the text. So these are sort of four different speaking tasks we use it to elicit their speaking performance. Okay, oh, what's going on? Yes. And then here is a list of the uh, transparency measures. As you did say, we try to you know, prepare the fine-grained uh, comprehensive set of fluency measures. So we prepare the, you know, these measures. But one thing that I have to note here is that we handle the two composite measures here, speech rate and mean length of run, as the, the speed fluency measure, just for the sake of the statistical analysis. As I said, uh, we you know, decided to use a I don't know, latent variable analysis which includes confirmatory factor analysis and structural equation modeling. Actually, we cannot you know, construct latent variable only by a single observed variable, which is the artificial end here. So that's why we, you know, just for the statistical reasons, we need to handle the speech rate and the mean length of run as an observed variables of the speed fluency. And theoretically motivated by the, these two measures can largely tap into the density of information, which uh, represents speed fluency as a construct. Okay, then, so this is a, um, how we measure the learner's cognitive fluency using a range of psycholinguistic measurements and linguistic knowledge tests. But in this talk, we will only you know, briefly go through this. So in a nutshell, we measure vocabulary, grammar, and pronunciation knowledge in terms of the two dimensions the based, uh, based on the theoretical uh, assumption of the speech production, that is resources and speed dimensions. So for instance, the student's vocabulary knowledge was measured by vocabulary size, by means of the productive vocabulary levels tests, and also lexical retrieval speed by means of the picture naming tasks. The same thing happened to grammatical knowledge, and we used the maze tasks to assess students' sentence construction skills, as well as the, the grammaticality judgment test, GJT, to assess their morphosyntactic syntactic knowledge. However, when it comes to pronunciation, it was really difficult and tricky to define the target likeness of pronunciation, right? So what the correct pronunciation is. So that's why we just follow the Kant's uh, methodological decision, and then we only measure the speed dimension of pronunciation, namely the articulatory speed, by using the control speaking task. So students basically read around the passage. Okay, so these are risks of the cognitive fluency measures. And then here's the final, the CFR model of cognitive fluency. In the end, we adopted the two-factor model for cognitive fluency, meaning that cognitive fluency is not a unitary construct, but it has two different dimensions. So one is a linguistic resource, which can be defined as a how widely learners know about the target language. The other one is uh, processing speed, uh, which refers to how efficiently or how quickly students can manipulate such linguistic resources for the purpose of language production. So in addition, a uh, linguistic level of the primary components of these two sub-dimensions or sub-constructs of cognitive fluency was different. For linguistic resources, the vocabulary size was the most primary representative uh, component of the, the, the variable, as indicated by the red color in the figure, so which supports the lexical, lexically driven nature of the speech production mechanism. So basically, the linguistic processes in the speech production begin with the lexical processes. Maybe this, you know, the strong uh, or primary uh, ratio of the, that, that the vocabulary levels test score can account for the variance of the linguistic resources is in line with such theoretical assumption of the speech production. So meanwhile, as for the processing speed, what matters was how quickly learners can construct sentences 
which was measured by the maze tasks. And then you know, all the re reaction time scores contribute significantly contributed to the processing speed. But among them, the syntactic processing or sentence construction may play the integral role in the in terms of the processing speed as a construct. Yeah. Okay. Then what about the atoms fluency? So this is a past diagram of the confirmed refactor analysis model of atoms fluency. And then in this model, and also subsequent SEM model, the values in the figure indicate the standardized regression coefficients of the past across four speaking tasks. From left to right, the argumentative speech, picture narrative tasks, leading to speaking tasks, and leading while listening to speaking tasks in the order that I you know, explained uh, the, you know, what the, you know, these speaking tasks look like. Then the current study supported the Tabakori and Skian's model and confirmed that its robustness across different speaking task types because they study uh, their study uses only picture narrative tasks to you know, validate their three-dimensional model. And then building on the uh, primary component of each dimension of atoms fluency, we can revisit the definition of them. So first, as represented by the artification rate, which is a pure measure of speed fluency, uh, the speed fluency can be reflected of the overall efficiency of speech productions. Yeah? Meanwhile, breakdown fluency may be defined as the speaker's ability to continue speech without disruptions in the L2 speech, L2 uh, specific speech processing, including vocabulary, grammar, and pronunciation. As Mitch Cross poses, uh, reflective of the breakdown breakdowns in the language processing, right? So for repair fluency, self-repetition rate was found as a primary component. So it could be possible that the repair fluency may refer to the ability to speak without this fluency phenomena, particularly self-repetition, that can happen when learners engage with self-monitoring processes or you know, just strategies or other strategies to buy time to uh, monitor their own speech processing or revise their uh, message so that they can express the message by their own uh, linguistic resources. Yeah. Okay, then how are they related? with each other. The SEM model here suggested that speed fluency was consistently associated with the processing speed across speaking tasks, but also with reading uh, linguistic resources only in leading to speaking tasks and leading while listening to speaking tasks, where the task relevant linguistic items are preemptively activated by you know, the input text, yeah? because they have to read the passage before speaking. So this may suggest that depending on to what extent speakers acquire the in-text linguistic items in the such integrated speaking tasks, the overall efficiency of speech production will vary. Yeah. So this is a, you know, this this is a you know, path from the linguistic resource to speed fluency indicates. Meanwhile, interestingly, breakdown fluency was associated with both of the processing speed and linguistic resource consistently across speaking tasks while processing speed showed slightly stronger um, contribution to breakdown fluency, yeah? So these results indicate that breakdown fluency measures might be able to uh, capture L2 competence in a relatively comprehensive manner compared to the speed fluency, yeah? So finally, the pair fluency was related to linguistic resource in the picture narrative tasks, and also the, the two types of uh, integrated skill tasks all of which predefine the content of speech before the students have to speak. Yeah? Considering these characteristics, the predefined content of speech, the repair fluency may reflect some aspects of linguistic competence only when students cannot avoid expressing some information to achieve the given task. So students were sort of forced to use some expressions or vocabulary or grammar to describe some certain aspects of the you know, visual prompt or text prompt. So this kind of task characteristic might you know, affect the relationship between the construct of cognitive fluency and atoms fluency. Yeah, so this is what I can what we can tell from the SCM results. Okay. Then, so this is kind of repetition of what I said. So regarding cognitive fluency, the latent variable of linguistic resource was primarily estimated, estimated by the score of the productive vocabulary size and accuracy scores of the syntactic knowledge test. So from the theoretical perspective, the knowledge about syntactic behavior of each lemma or each word is stored in the mental lexicon. So we consider this component of linguistic competence is particularly effective of the breadth and also the depths of vocabulary knowledge, uh, basically stored in the mental lexicon. 
So meanwhile, the latent variable of processing speed was mainly associated with the direction time score in the sentence construction tasks, which is a maze task. So therefore, we consider processing speed of cognitive fluency uh, can represent the automaticity of syntactic encoding processes to you know that, that to large extent. So this is what we can tell from the CFR uh, confirmatory factor analysis of the cognitive fluency. And then uh, this is a summary of findings from our SEM uh, results. The speed fluency was mainly associated with the processing speed in all the speaking tasks, whereas linguistic resources how widely or deeply students know about the language only contributed to speed fluency in integrated speaking tasks, where the relevant linguistic knowledge is activated uh, by reading the passage before you know, retelling the content of the passage. So meanwhile, vector fluency was generally associated with both of linguistic resource and processing speed in all tasks. So meaning that the breakdown fluency uh, might be the aspect of fluency that can reflect underlying linguistic competence in a relatively uh, comprehensive manner. Uh, yeah, this is what I can tell. But although you know people tend to use you know the speed fluency measures or composite measures as a sort of representative measure of fluency in many uh, second language research, but our results show that the breakdown fluency measure might be more useful to capture the you know the linguistic knowledge or you know, something underlying the fluent speech from the perspective of the linguistic processing. Yes, the finally, the whether repair fluency is reflective of linguistic competence depends on how much information are students forced to describe or express in the speaking tasks. So when students cannot avoid describing something, repairing behavior, particularly a self-repetition, can be reflective of the linguistic competence because why the linguistic repertoire would be helpful to express uh, even the revised message when you know students encounter the breakdowns. So even they encounter the breakdowns, they have to you know communicate or verbalize their thoughts by modifying their message so that they can sort of express on on their own you know linguistic resources. Yeah. Okay. So building on these findings, we have a couple of the implications for pedagogies. So our fundamental you know suggestion is to help students to widen. Uh, their lexical repertoires for productive use, uh, meaning that students can assist them to use them in a relatively spontaneous context without you know, pressure of the communication. And in addition, our results show that regarding grammatical knowledge, it is important to um, um, you know, improve you know, how accurate uh, or target like their linguistic knowledge is, but also how quickly they can retrieve them yeah, in a relatively uh, spontaneous manner. Yeah? So in this sense, some meaningful communicative practice with some time pressure might be useful, suggested by the Yuji Suzuki, yeah, which is another Suzuki in the, you know, the domain of fluency research. <laughs> Finally, as our measure of articulation rate uh, significantly contributes to the latent variable the processing speed, right? So we cannot we can suggest that some articulatory skills, some you know, motor skills can enhance the entire speed of articulation, such as linking or vowel reductions. Could be improved through the form focus instruction suggested by the uh, Kazuya Saito. Yeah? So this is our study one about the relationship between linguistic knowledge and fluency performance. So now we will introduce the second study that examined the task effects on fluency performance using the fine grained set of the fluency measures. So now I'm handing over to Yudit by stopping the screen sharing here. All right, thank you, Shungo, for the detailed and really insightful uh, discussion of our uh, study one. And I'm going to share on the screen, let me just one moment, share screen um, for study two. And please listen carefully because this is a study we haven't yet published. So um, it is uh, a great honor again to, to present on this. So not, not a lot of people have heard about these results um, before. Um, so as I said at the beginning, we were also interested in how oral fluency varies across um, tasks. And uh, this question uh, has been quite extensively studied, mostly from this CAF uh, complexity accuracy uh, framework. And um, anyone who is familiar with the uh, with the uh, complexity accuracy framework uh, would um, would know that there are two competing uh, models: um, the cognition hypothesis 
and the limited attentional capacity model. Um, they, they are competing models, but they are also complementary in, uh, in many ways. So Robinson's cognitive, uh, cognition hypothesis proposed that the cognitive demands of tasks are dependent on task characteristics, such as the number of steps or the elements involved in the task. And then these CAF measures, complexity, accuracy, and fluency, change depending on the complexity of the task. And, and they change kind of in relation to each other because search students might prior prioritize uh, one aspect over the other. Uh, Skian's limited attentional capacity uh, model uh, examine the role of task complexity from the perspective of attentional demands on speech production uh, processes and made predictions about uh, how different task characteristics will affect the processes of speech production, including conceptualization, lexical retrieval, etc., and how this will then co-vary and be determined by limited uh, attentional resources. Um, and this is the, the SLA field. And in the general field of uh, cognitive psychology, we have the dual processing theory of higher cognition by Evans and Stanovich. And, and they also propose that task complexity, the cognitive demands of, of task, interact with how much um, attentional and working memory resources you have available for the type, particular type of task, and that will influence the efficiency of task performance. So in cognitive psychology, we hear uh, we have a, a theory which is very similar to these competing uh, psycho, uh, 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 theories. Right now, um, if we want to understand the interaction of the speech uh, um, processing demands of, of task and the speech production processes, then um, um, it is useful to look at this slide and look at the different uh, arrows. So you can see there are arrows A, B, and, and, and C, and D. So I'm going to talk you through all of them. So we have the observable level of what happens at the, at the um, um, speech speaking task, uh, and we have the speaker internal level, right? So observable level is, um, I think, your right-hand side, and then the um, internal level is the left-hand side. So a speaking task will first uh, impose different demands on each stage of speech production, and this can be seen in the arrow A. And then in response to a given task, um, speakers will use their attentional resources for conscious and controlled processing in each sta stage of the um, uh, speech production, which proceeds in this serial manner from conceptualization to formulation to articulation. And this is, can be seen in arrow B. Now, depending on the demands on conceptualization, right, how much I have to think about the content of what I'm going to say, um, the amount of attentional resources uh, available for the follow-up processes is going to change. And, um, and that's what you can see in arrow number C. So if I have a very cognitively demanding task, having to talk about something very complex, then all my attentional resources will be taken up by um, planning what I want to say, and I will have less attention for accuracy and, and so on. So for, for linguistic formulation. Um, so that was arrow C. Now let's, what is arrow D? Um, this is uh, the, when the speaker is automaticity, as well as the, the amount of attention resources available, will determine what, what what do we see at the level of fluency uh, at the observable level? So that's that's ROD, right? So if I'm a very um, a speaker that has very highly automatized second language speech production processes, right? I'm a very proficient, highly automatic uh, speaker. Um, even if I might get a difficult task, you might see um, um, a high level of fluency. And then maybe for lower level learners, they might be more fluent on difficult task, uh, on less difficult task, and 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 more uh, less fluent in more demanding tasks. Right. So this is what you see as a kind of theoretical assumption in the theoretical background. Um, 
There have been several studies, uh, again, uh, who have looked at conceptualizing demands, conceptualizing demands on, on fluency, because this is what you can actually manipulate a lot of the times in, in task design, how difficult it will be to come up with the content and how you how you support students in uh, in producing the information that then they will have to express in another language. Um, a series of studies have been conducted by um, by Pauline Foster and, and Parvane Tavakoli, and they um, manipulated the structure of the tasks. So they had tightly structured tasks and more loosely structured tasks. And in the tightly structured tasks, um, there are uh, lower attentional uh, demands for conceptualization because the structure is given um, and more attentional resources will be available consequently for linguistic encoding and articulation. And what you what they saw as a result at the level of speech phenomena was a reduction in silent uh, poses, but somewhat more uh, false stars. Uh, in another series of studies um, that we conducted with my former PhD student Yvonne Prefontaine uh, with speakers of French as an additional language, we uh, asked students to complete two different types of narrative tasks. And one of them, they had to tell a story based on five um, different pictures um, that were unrelated to each other. So they had to come up with what, what connects the pictures and, and, and uh, tell us a story. And we also gave the students a cartoon to, to, to narrate where uh, the, the events in the story were visually described. So uh, again, the unrelated story was supposed to pose higher conceptualization demands because you have to come up with the storyline um, and, um, and the related pictures, the comics, the content was given. What we found was um, quite very much in line with uh, what we would predict based on the uh, conceptualization demands, mainly um, that in the unrelated picture narrative task, there was lower articulation rate, um, participants were less uh, fluent in terms of speed, and they made um, uh, shorter silent poses. Um, so that was um, um, some change in, in breakdown fluency as well. So what we um, conclude can conclude based on these findings that if you increase the conceptualization demands, so the, the informational complexity and the planning complexity of the task, this would negatively affect um, the speed fluency measures. So the overall speed with which you produce um, a language, right? Now let us move on to um, our study two. In more detail, um, as I said, it was concerned with uh, task-related variation in oral fluency. We manipulated the task demands, and we were looking. And we were very interested in finding out how it influences different fine-grained measures of fluency. Um, just as in the previous study, there were 128 Japanese learners of English. Actually, they were the same learners. Um, university students, mostly at the B1, B2 level. And we, um, as uh, Shungo already described the task, they, they had four uh, speaking tasks to do. Um, I'll say a bit more about these tasks um, because um, to understand what kind of um, demands they, they pose for the students. We had an argumentative task. Students had a thesis statement and they had to argue, uh, give arguments uh, about this thesis statement. So theoretically, the content planning, the conceptualization demands are high here. Uh, we didn't give the students any linguistic input. We just said, here is the title, write an essay about it. Um, and there was no activation of phonological information. What is that? You'll, you'll see it in a moment. Um, Picture narrative task. Um, here uh, we ask students to narrate um, a, a comic uh, strip. Um, the content was given. The storyline was depicted in the uh, in the cartoon. Uh, so we thought that the conceptualization demand would be. Um, lower. Um, again, no linguistic input, no phonological input. Um, there were just visuals given to the students. Um, what? So this, this, these are the two types of tasks that have been very traditionally compared in this type of um, research of task-based language teaching. Uh, where we added to this is um, 
a, a, an integrated task type, which is more frequently used in, in classrooms, also in assessment nowadays. And one of these tasks was kind of monomodal. So just one modality and the other one was kind of bimodal, multimodality. So we asked students to read um, a text and then summarize what they had read orally. Uh, we thought that the conceptualization demands would be again lower, because they read the text, the content was there, hopefully, if they understood what the text was about. Um, there was linguistic input here, right? Because the students read the text in English and they had to retell it in English. So a lot of the words, a lot of the syntactic constructions were actually in the reading text um, and they could have activated students' um, lexical knowledge, uh, syntactic knowledge, etc. If you just read the text, there is no phonological, uh, no activation of phonological information, as opposed to when you hear a text, right, the phonological form of the word, the pronunciation of the words is activated. So this is what we meant by the activation of phonological information. And this is what happened in the what we call the reading while listening uh, speaking task. So this was an integrated task and the students could read the text and listen to it at the same time. So this is this multimodal task that is becoming more prevalent in our digital age that you can read and listen at the same time. So just as the, the this only this task only differed from the other one in the activation of phonological information. So at least that's what we thought, right? Um, now, what did we analyze? Uh, we uh, measured speed fluency, which is articulation rate. And then there was a question in the chat, what is the difference between speed fluency and, and breakdown fluency? Speed fluency is an overall measure of how quickly so, and somebody is able to speak. Um, for example, I'm a relatively quick um, speaker. And uh, theoretically, uh, the speed fluency measure only includes this speed element. Um, fluency also has a breakdown um, part, right? Um, where I pose, how often I pose, and, and for how long. And that's, this is what is um, measured by the mid-close pose ratio and the end-close ratio, which is the frequency of, of closes um, and, the mid, and the duration of the poses. And this is what we measured, similar to the other study that Shungo presented just a few minutes ago. And then the repair fluency is, is how, how you repair yourself, how frequently, and whether you use self-corrections, false starts, or self-repetition, right? So these are the standard measures that are generally used in uh, research. Okay, so uh, what happened um, in, um, in, in terms of our, our findings? Um, what you see here is that in terms of articulation rate, speed fluency, um, the uh, picture narration task is the least fluent task of all, um, and it is significantly less fluent, or and and participants speak le significantly less uh, quickly in the picture narrative task than in the argumentative task, and um, this is true also for the uh, reading to speak task. So the, in the reading to speak task, students speak significantly faster than in the picture narrative. Right? No differences between the picture narrative and the other task, though. Right. Um, so uh, here, uh, what we uh, see is um, the mid and the end close uh, pose ratio. Red bars are mid close poses, and uh, and yellow orange bars are the um, uh, end close poses. Very uh, similar findings. Um, the uh, picture narrative task is the one that is the least um, fluent in terms of pose ratio. Another um, finding with regards to field pose ratio, again, quite similar picture narrative task is the least fluent one um, here too. Um, the next slide, mid and end close uh, um, pose length. Um, so we here we uh, break the monotony of the findings somewhat uh, because here we see a significant difference uh, between uh, the reading to speak task, so the mono, mono, um, uh, monomodal task and the multimodal um, task in terms of mid-close ratio. Students um, pose much more uh, often in the multimodal task than in the single-modal task. And 
but the end close close ratio um, um, reflects some of the earlier findings, namely a significant difference between the picture narrative compared um, to the um, reading to speak task. Right. Um, self repetition um, again. Quite similar findings, um, a picture narrative tasks significantly less fluent than the argumentative and the single model reading to speak task. And um, you can see that again, uh, the picture narrative is the one that is less uh, fluent in terms of self-correction and, and false starts as well, um, depicted in the orange and gray bars. Okay, um, what, what does this um, then leave us with? How can we explain these findings? Um, let's go back to the characteristics of the task and then compare the findings kind of task by task. Um, argumentative task versus picture narrative uh, task. Uh, we see higher uh, speed um, in the argumentative task um, and, um, and a lot more breakdown and repair uh, in the narrative task um, than uh, in the narrative task than in the argumentative uh, task. Um, why is that? Um, despite the conceptualization demands. Um, we assume that perhaps the open-ended nature of the argumentative task allows students to tailor what they wanted to say to their existing linguistic resources. They might have come up with quite complex arguments, but they might have realized it in the pre-task planning stage that they don't have the linguistic resources to express them. So then they talked about um, arguments and, and supportive examples that they could express uh, using their linguistic resources because the task actually gave them this freedom. Uh, whereas with the picture narrative task, you have to narrate this, uh, the story. And if there are key elements in the story, um, tools, et cetera, that, that, or scenes that need to be described, then there is a need to retrieve certain vocabulary items. And this might have increased the uh, demands and attentional processing. Students had to search for words, had to express the story, otherwise it wasn't understandable. So this is our assumption and, and potential explanation. Let us continue. Let's compare the picture narrative task to the reading to speak task. This is where we also saw quite a lot of um, differences um, uh, between the, the reading to speak task and the picture narration uh, task. Um, Again, picture narration task has slower articulation rate, more mid-close poses, fewer but longer end-close poses, more field poses, fewer repetitions, more false starts, longer mid-close poses. Um, so overall, um, a lot lower in terms of all fluency features. Um, we thought that one of the differences here is caused by the fact that if you have the reading to speaking task, the, the linguistic con knowledge or the linguistic items are activated uh, when you read the input text. And even if there might be some gap between your receptive knowledge, so you might understand the words in the reading task, but you may not be able to fully retrieve it in the, um, uh, in the retelling, this uh, didn't really reduce um, a fluency and, and it maybe even facilitated students use of items that weren't fully acquired. Um, and even though there was, again, a necessity to recall and select the content of the source text, it still um, supported students' fluency much more than the, the picture narrative task. And then the last comparison, the monomodal um, task compared to the multimodal task, we saw that um, we, we assumed that this multimodal task would support students in uh, producing more fluent speech because they would hear the uh, pronunciation of the words, they can read and follow. However, this is not what we found. And maybe this bimodal input was actually not helpful for the students. Maybe they couldn't follow at the same time as the reading went, but also maybe um, there was a competition in this um, uh, bimodal input that might have um, um, kind of um, prevented students from, from retrieving some of the linguistic items. We would need to look into uh, this effect more, but, but this is what we, we um, supposed would happen. Um, right, so what are finally the implications of study two? Um, you can see that 
we might manipulate certain features of tasks as researchers, as teachers, as language assessors. And we might assume that if we change this in the task, this is going to be cognitively more complex, cognitively less complex. But as, as you can see in our results, um, our assumptions are not necessarily reflected in how uh, students perform in the task because they might allocate their uh, intentional resources based on their existing knowledge quite strategically. Um, and that might affect the fluency you see in the, in the output. Um, Multiple tasks are needed to assess students' fluency in speech production so that we saw quite significant variation across tasks. And if you had used just one of them, you might not have uh, gained an accurate uh, insight into what students' fluency actually is like. Um, and as you can see, if you use different types of tasks, uh, they have different demands on speech production. And it's important that students practice on different types of uh, tasks because this is what would eventually develop their, their fluency. And we also need to consider how certain fluency vulnerabilities, breakdowns, um, rephrasing, etc., cetera, um, can be avoided or uh, kind of how we can support students to avoid them uh, when they speak. Um, and what we can do in terms of pre-teaching of vocabulary, allowing students to plan in their first language, second language, multiple languages, um, rehearsal, um, um, allowing students to rehearse their, their speech. So uh, hopefully you can see in our presentation as well that we, we have rehearsed it and it's um, more fluent than uh, if I just had given it kind of impromptu. Um, task repetition. So maybe if I give this same talk again at another conference, it's going to be even more, uh, more fluent. And then feedback and how we can enhance students' fluency by feedback and asking them to perform the task again. So um, that concludes the, our presentation and thank you for your attention. And I think we have a couple of more minutes for, for questions. So I'll stop sharing. And thank you very much once again for inviting us